So hello and welcome everyone. I'm delighted uh, to introduce our first event of 2023. So thank you all for joining us either live through Zoom or if you're watching back on YouTube, thank you for joining us uh, today. So this is uh, one of our Tuesday Spotlight uh, lectures, which is part of our free uh, event series. So, and this is starting our wider theme called Visualising Egypt, which will explore the diversity and complexity of uh, North African art and how it has inspired contemporary artists. And uh, as an opportunity here, I wanted to say thank you to all of our supporters and members. Uh, it's Without you, we wouldn't be able to host these free events to share uh, Egyptian cultural heritage around the world. So thank you very much. And uh, if you're want to take your interest further please do consider becoming a member but back to uh why we are all here today um i'm delighted to introduce our first tuesday spotlight of the year entitled the kandake today uh, the legacy of sudanese hero queens and um our speaker uh with us today thank you so much for joining us so Ju julian cooper is an egyptologist and archaeologist specializing in the cultures of ancient nubia and sudan Dan. Uh, he has recently taught Egyptology at the United International College Beijing Normal University in China, and he directs a survey of Eastern Sudan, the Adbai Survey Project, which if you are a member, you will have received your recent uh, issue of Egyptian archaeology, where you can learn all about their recent research uh, in one of the articles there. So again, thank you so much, Julian, for joining us. I'm very excited for your lecture today. Uh, please do share your screen and I will leave uh, the room to you. Thank you, Charlotte, and thank you to the EES uh, for letting me present on this topic, um, and especially a topic that I have not presented on before. So uh, everyone, including Charlotte, bear with me. Usually I talk about, uh, when I present at any forum like this, I talk about my fieldwork in Eastern Sudan. Today I'm gonna to talk about something incredibly different which is the legacy of a particular symbol that is a symbol of ancient Sudanese queens in modern cultures today. And the name of these queens in ancient Sudan was Kandake, which is why I've called this lecture the Kandake today. How have these ancient Sudanese queens been revivified in modern cultures? And how do people use this symbol or icon or even the very queens themselves in modern cultures. And I, what I would like to emphasize here is this particular queen, uh, this particular symbol of ancient Sudanese history is going through a massive phase of revivification. It's being promulgated in all sorts of different media, in politics, in a way that it wasn't before. And this is incredibly rare to happen in history in general. It's not often in times we revivify heroes. These queens are 2,000 years old or more. It's not often that we pick someone from the ancient past and revivify them just as vividly as the Kandake. For many of you that follow the politics and history of the Middle East, you this picture will be familiar to you. This is a picture of the Sudanese protester, a young engineering student, Allah Salah, sitting on top of, sorry, standing on top of a car, chanting against the regime of Omar al-Bashir in 2019 in Sudan in the so-called Khartoum protests. These were protests against the old regime in Sudan. And this image went viral, went viral in Sudan, viral throughout the Middle East, and it went viral everywhere. You can see all the Sudanese protesters taking photos of al Salah and putting it on Facebook, putting it on social media. And what was very interesting and what I want to start my talk with today was what they called Miss Salah, what they called Allah Salah. In all the social media, they began to call Allah Salah a kandake. Now, kandake is not a word that is so well known everywhere that you would call anyone protesting a kandake. A kandake is the word for ancient Sudanese queens in the Meroitic language. So this is a really rare event in history that we have widespread population using the name of an ancient queen and labeling one of the leading protesters, uh, Al Salah, a kandake. And then it went further. It started saying all Sudanese women protest 
characters could be Kandake or were Kandake. And this famous photograph by Lana Haroon really cemented uh, Ala Salah and protesting Sudanese women as an icon to be connected with these ancient Sudanese queens. So all these new protests with women would be likened to the power of the ancient Kandake, these ancient Sudanese queens. And this was picked up by all news channels, Al Jazeera, the BBC. And here you can see his BBC news um, story. We have, she has been dubbed Kandake, which means Nubian queen. Now, many Sudanese I've spoken to about this word uh, are now very familiar with it. The word Kandake is now very common in Sudanese circles. In the past, it was common amongst historians, archaeologists, intellectuals, and so forth. But now it's really common to everyone as a result of this social media. I want to emphasize here that Allah Salah is not dressed in clothing that is necessarily indicative of an ancient Sudanese queen. Of course, it's dressed in uh, very lovely garb and beautiful garb, but it's not clothing that is exactly like an ancient Sudanese queen. It's clothing that is more indicative of the mid 20th century in Sudan, like wedding clothing, they would say the tob in Arabic, and she's got large gold earrings on. So it's certainly indicative of someone of dressing in nice clothing, but not specifically a kandake. So when they called Allah Salah a kandake, they were really calling her and likening her to someone that is leading, a woman leading in modern Sudan, which is very befitting the role of an ancient Sudanese queen, who, as we will see, could also lead their ancient empire. So ancient Sudanese queens were not just uh, consorts to their kings, they could rule the nation independently. So the, this image of Ala Salah, the Kandake, has gone everywhere. It's gone in Sudan, it's even in graffiti in Shoreditch, as you can see from this image, Shoreditch in London. And there's all these different images online and everywhere, a likening Ala Salah and the Kandake to like the Statue of Liberty, the Sudanese Revolution. And it's put together these ideas of independent Sudanese protesters powerful Sudanese women and the downfall of the regime of Omar Bashir, which I won't talk about in this lecture, but of course everyone can go online and they'll know plenty about that if they don't already. So now let's go to the historical origins of the Kandake. Where are people getting this word from and what does it mean and how does it to the present? Uh, for this, this talk isn't really about ancient Egypt, I apologize. And just a very brief rundown of Sudanese Nubian history. The empire in ancient Nubia we usually call the Kushite Empire. We can very basically divide it into three phases. The Kerma phase, which is very early, then the Parton phase, and the Meroitic phase. It's this Meroitic phase where we have almost all of our evidence for these powerful Kandake queens. And these phases are named after the various capitals in Sudan where these ancient empires were headquartered. And it's in this Meroitic phase, this last phase of the Kushite history from 540 BCE to 350 CE, where we see the word Kandake. And the reason for that is pretty simple. It's because in this period, the Meroitic and Kushite people use their own new script. The script is based off the Egyptian Demotic script, but it's writing their own language. Before the Meroitic period, Kushite people did not write in the language of their, their, of their own indigenous language. They used Egyptian hieroglyphs and Egyptian language to promulgate their elite texts, much like how, say, Latin rulers of medieval, sorry, of medieval European rules used Latin to promulgate their literature. So in this last phase of Kushite history, we have these indigenous texts written in their own language, and this is where we see the word Kandake. And it also seems to be this phase where we see most of these uh, very obvious indigenous features in Kushite history at the expense of Egyptian features. So in the Meroitic period, we see more and more queens ruling independently without kings, where we don't have certain evidence of it in earlier periods. This Meroitic period is named after the city of Meroe, a very famous city in the archaeology of Nubia and Sudan. These, this picture here is the Acropolis, the burial ground of Meroitic kings and queens, and the people 
just like the Egyptian pharaohs, were buried under these pyramids and including the queens of Nubia. So who were the Kandake? Here's an image of one, the Kandake Amani Tore, ruling around 50 BCE. Um, I said to you before that in the Meroitic periods, they write in their own language. The problem with this is scholars do not yet know how to completely translate this language. We can sound it out, we can translate many parts of this language, but certainly not on the level of, say, Egyptian hieroglyphs, where we can more or less translate everything in the language. So while a lot of our information comes from texts of this period, we can't yet translate the complete text, which means that the Kandake, Kushite kings, Kushite rituals, Kushite history is still quite mysterious when you compare it with Egyptian history. So Kandake in the own language, the language we call Meroitic, probably meant something like sister, but we think it was specifically used for queen mother or mother of the king or something like this. In other languages spoken in modern day Sudan related to Meroitic, the word kede or something like this still means sister, for example, in the Nara language. This is how it is spelt in ancient Meroitic texts, and it was either spelt with these consonants kedeke or keteke. It passed into Egyptian hieroglyphs as kentike, passed into Greek kandake, and then finally Latin and then English Kandake or Candice. So the, the modern name Candice actually has its origin in this Meroitic word. So you can tell that to any friends of yours that have the name Candice. The first known Kandake or a Kandake that, sorry, it's the first known Sudanese queen that's possibly a Kandake. She's not actually called a Kandake in the text. She's called a king's wife. Comes from this very mysterious temporarily from the temple at Semna around 1000 BCE. This is in the Napartan period. And here we have a queen featured very prominently in this inscription. Uh, we don't actually know the name of the king at the time. We know that there sort of was a king because the text mentions a king's wife. And she is named as Katimala. We don't really know much else about this person. We know that queens continue through Napartan history and Kushite history but this seems to be the first image of one from the Napartan period. When we go into Meroitic period, Kandake are much, much more prominent in the art historical record and the archeological record. Here we have the well-known Kandake Amani Shaketo, pictured here on the front of a Meroitic temple. And she's doing something that many of you will be familiar with from the art history of ancient Egypt. Like an Egyptian pharaoh, she's conquering all the enemies. You can see her here ritually, or some people believe uh, literally as well, killing the foreigners, the enemies of the Meroitic Kushite regime. You can see she's depicted in all sorts of regalia, specific crowns, Horus above her here. Uh, she has her own garb that is specific to the queens of Kush, and she has this large spear which she's using to conquer her enemies, and she's named in this cartouche as Amani Shaketo. She is one of the Kandake of Kush. And you can see on this drawing of Timothy Kendall, Timothy Kendall brought out an interesting feature of this Kandake, and that is these lines here on her cheek, which are probably scarification. For any of you that have been to Sudan or know Sudan's many uh, peoples in Sudan, certainly not all Sudanese, but many peoples in Sudan still practice scarification today, especially on their cheeks like this, where you would have lines of scarification. And this sort of feature you would not see in earlier reliefs or you'd nef never see in Egyptian reliefs. So this shows us that the indigenous Meroitic culture is really coming out in the depictions of these Kandake, these ruling queens. We don't actually know how many Kandake ruled independently. Here are some of the most prominent and some of the ones that we think ruled independently, that is ruled without a king. Kandake always existed even when there was a king in the Meroitic Empire, but there were also Kandake that ruled without kings. And this is obvious in the textual artistic record. And it's also clear when foreign Greek writers come to Sudan and they write about Sudan, they note that ancient queens could rule in their own right. Some of the prominent queens here, is, for example, we have Shanakta Heti, Amani Renas, who's very prominent in the textual record as well as someone who fought against the Roman Empire. 
Amani Shaketo, who is very well known for her jewelry. Her jewelry was found in her pyramid and is now in the Berlin Museum. Naui Demak, and we also have Amani Torre. The reason why Sudanese queens are so prominent in the Meroitic period and in Nubian culture in general has been a bit of a mystery and various scholars have talked about this. One of the reasons they seem to be more prominent is in ancient Sudan, there seems to be a pattern of matrilineal inheritance. That means inheritance on the mother's line rather than through the father's line. So in ancient Egypt, for example, we usually consider inheritance, that is succession of kings going in the patrilineal line, which would go through the line of the father. And that's what, for example, we have with the succession and inheritance of pharaonic kings. So because of matrilineal inheritance, we do have a little bit of a greater emphasis on women and the identity with the women's line. That doesn't mean that women are always rulers. In fact, most of Sudanese and Meroitic kings are kings, they're male. Uh, but what it does mean is that we have a sort of identity vested in the female line. And this plays out in the art historical record in Kush. Women are part of this matrilineal inheritance. They're present in rituals. They're present in every coronation. And they're even present in images depicting warfare like this one. So they have a very central place in the political life of Kush. One of the most famous of these uh, Kandake is Amani Shaketo, and she is famous somewhat for slightly negative circumstances in the sense that her pyramid was plundered and even the top of it was dynamited, if we're to believe the records, by Fellini, an Italian explorer who found all this jewellery. This jewellery is now in the Berlin Museum, and this jewellery shows us that what we see on the reliefs of, the, of these Kandake is not just some sort of artistic license, but they really did have all this amazing gold jewelry. Here's an image of one of these in the Berlin Museum that depicts very similar things to what we see in the artistic groups. So we know the Kandake were generously adorned. We know that they were very powerful. We know that they were part of ritual and coronation, and we know that they could lead their people in war. Here we have what foreigners say about these Kandake in their own time. So we have the famous geographer Strabo. He says the Ethiopians, in his time, Ethiopians was the word for the Meroitic Kushites. The Ethiopians attacked the Fibae, that is attacked Egypt, and the garrison of free cohorts at Syena, that's Aswan today. They enslaved all the inhabitants and even pulled down the statues of Caesar. Among these were also the generals of Queen Kandake, who ruled the Ethiopians in my time. And he calls her a manly woman who had lost one of her eyes. And then Pliny says the town of Meroe, that is the capital, had only a few buildings. A woman, Kandake, ruled. This name has been passed from queen to queen for many years. This text calling the Kandake a name rather than a title has been very influential. And until recently, it was thought that Kandake was actually some sort of name that was used again and again and again. We now know it's just a regular title for ruling queens at the time. So when these foreign geographers saw Kush, they were sort of uh, found it remarkable that we have a ruling queen. Of course, in the ancient Mediterranean world, ruling queens existed, but were certainly not the norm. And these geographers like Strabo and Pliny noted this. They found this very special that if you go south of Egypt into Sudan, we have these ruling queens that are e even leading their own nation in warfare. In the British Museum, we have this huge statue of a Roman emperor, Augustus. And this statue was found in the capital city of Meroe. It's one of the most fantastic items in the British Museum. It's a bit large, large bronze head. And if I flick backwards for a second, and we go to Strabo's account, where it says, and even pulled down the statues of Caesar. It's quite likely that what, what's happening in these Kushite raids north into Roman Egypt is the origin of this particular statue that was found in the capital center, capital of the Kushite Empire. The Kushites, under their ruling queen, had invaded the Egyptian borderlands and taken this large, large statue of Augustus, one of the most famous Roman emperors, back to Meroe, showing how powerful these Sudanese queens were. The Kandake also entered the fictional discourse of the ancient world. They entered stories. And one of the most well-known of these stories where she features 
is called the Alexander Romance. The Alexander Romance is a largely fictional account of the life of Alexander the Great. Many things happened in the Alexander Romance that Alexander the Great historically couldn't have done or impossible, and it often conflates different peoples around the ancient world. Uh, but the, for our purpose, it's important to know that the Kandake enters these stories and starts to crystallize as a sort of heroic, beautiful queen on the edge of the known world for Greco-Roman people. And in this text, it, the Alexander the Great writes a letter to the Kandake. It starts after Alexander had written to Aristotle. He led his army to Semiramis's palace. Semiramis almost story to Mesopotamia. He earnestly desired to see it, for it was very famous in the whole country and in Greece. A woman ruled over the city. She was extremely beautiful, prime of her life, and a descend descendant of Queen Semiramis. To her, Alexander sent a letter with the following contents. King Alexander greets Queen Kandake of Meroe, and the rulers came to Egypt. I learned from the priests there and saw graves and houses of yours, showing that you had ruled over it for some time and that Ammon had gone to war together with you. So in this tale, which is passed through many cultures, in Greek, in Roman, Ethiopian, Arabic, Syriac, it's even uh, translated in Persian, it's, it's, it goes into Europe and medieval Europe, this story of a Kandake, a queen of Nubia, promulgates throughout the world, the ancient world and medieval world. And this story has very different iterations and repetitions. In some of the story, if it goes on, I won't translate all of you. Uh, Alexander has a sort of romantic relationship with the Kandake. In another story, a version of the story, Alexander is threatened by the Kandake, but nevertheless marvels at her palace. In most of the stories, the Kandake's brother uh, ends up in a feud with Alexander. So all these different stories, all these different things happen. Uh, none of which are sort of uh, easy to trace what the original is because the story has so many different versions, iterations, translations, and is passed down into many, many different languages and cultures. But it is still an ancient story, despite it being fictional. And even in Europe or the Mediterranean, this story had impact. And some people even think it impacted the the sort of stories that you would see in Knight's Tales and things like this. And here in these images of this story, these are translations of the Alexander Romance into various languages, such as Ottoman Turkish, Greek, uh, Latin, and so forth. We have images in the illustrated manuscripts of the Kandake. You can see most of these artists haven't really attempted to draw what we would think of as a Nubian or Sudanese queen. They've just drawn a queen as it would be in their own culture. So you can see here in this Ottoman Turkish manuscript, Kandake just looks like more or less what you'd expect a woman to look like in Ottoman Turkey. Same in this Paris Codex and this manuscript from the Bodleian Library. It's more or less depicting Alexander and the Kandake just as they would have been depicted in a European context. We also see Kandake in the Bible. And many of you will be familiar with this. It's quite a difficult text to understand. Uh, in this text, we have the person of Philip the Evangelist converting an official who belongs to the Kandake. And I'll just read the first paragraph out. It says, now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, get up and go south to the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So Philip started out and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch. Remember, Ethiopian in this period almost certainly means Nubia and the Kushite Empire a court official in charge of the entire treasury of Kandake, a queen of the Ethiopians. He had gone to Jerusalem to worship and on his return was sitting in his chariot reading Isaiah the prophet, that is reading Isaiah from what we would call the Old Testament. So we have a official of the Kandake all the way in the Levant near Jerusalem. No, no one's really sure what he's doing here. No one's really sure on the specific identification of this person or whether the Greek word eunuch is really correctly translating what this official would be to the Kandake. But because it's entered the Bible, this idea of the Kandake has entered wider European thought from Christianity and onwards, including in the depictions. 
So here we have some nice medieval depictions in the monologio of Basil II. We have Philip depicted on the chariot with the Kandake's court official. You can see that the artists here are very much trying to identify the Kandake's official as someone of African descent with darker colored skin. And here we have this medieval engraving from the Netherlands in a similar fashion. In the story, Philip baptizes the uh, Kandake's official. We're not really sure why this Kandake's official is in Jerusalem. If he's reading Isaiah, it seems that he would have access to what we would think of as Jewish texts, but we don't actually have any evidence of Jewish texts in the Kushite Empire or Judaism in general in the Kushite Empire in this period. So it's a bit of a mystery why and how this Kandake got to Jerusalem and what he is doing there. Um, so whether you're what you say as a historian regarding this particular scenario is quite difficult. This image of the African eunuch, the Ethiopian eunuch, has gone throughout time in Europe uh, to be one of the most famous parts of the Book of Acts depicted. Here we can see Rembrandt depicting the same scene of Philip baptizing the Ethiopian eunuch, the official of the Kandake. This is not the Kandake, it's just the Kandake's official. And we have Abel de Pujol doing the same thing, sorry, Pujol doing the same thing, baptizing this African man. In some traditions, this is considered to be the first African Christian. Of course, this is a much larger debate and much more complicated by how Christianity itself traveled into Egypt, Ethiopia, and Sudan. This tradition of a Kandake, even though the Meroitic Kushite Empire stopped in the fifth century, never seems to have completely left Sudan in the oral traditions, that is the long folklore of Sudan. James Bruce, who was a famous explorer who went from Alexandria to Ethiopia and tried to find the source of the Blue Nile, returned back to Alexandria by going through Ethiopia and Sudan overland on a very, very difficult journey in the 1790s. When Bruce arrived at the town of Shendi, the modern town of Shendi, which is very close to Meroe and its pyramids, he records this information after talking with the people in Shendi. He says, there is a tradition at Shendi that a woman whose name was Hendak, and you can see the obvious phonetic similarities between Kandake, once governed all that country whence we might imagine that this was part of the kingdom of Kandake. So Bruce, who's aware of the Christian texts and is aware of uh, the, the Greco-Roman geographers, makes this connection between the person, a, an ancient woman that the local people in Shendi pronounce as Hendak, we take Bruce's word for how it's pronounced, and connects it to Kandake, the ancient queens. Going to a very, very different part of history, Kandake also makes a feature in African American culture. Uh, for anyone logging in from America, they'd be very familiar with who this person is. This is W.E.B. Du Bois. Du Bois is a giant in the African-American intellectual movement of the late uh, 1800s and early 1900s. He is most celebrated as one of the founders of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, an institution that remains uh, present in the United States today, uh, trying to commit to causes of social justice for African Americans and so forth. Du Bois published many things in his life. He was a sociologist, he was a historian, he worked for the advancement of African Americans and social justice. He really did many things. He's a polymath and an intellectual in the broadest sense of that world. And one of the other things that Du Bois wanted to do was promulgate Pan-Africanism. Pan-Africanism is this idea that Africans should get together to solve the African problems. In Du Bois's day, it also referred to this idea of decolonization, that is African nations should be allowed to rule themselves and not be ruled by others. As part of this program, Du Bois also took a hand to directing and he directed a pageant which was a very popular sort of form of media at the time with thousands of people uh, being able to see these sort of public pageants. And these pageants were designed to tell the long, long story of African peoples in general, not a specific part of Africa, but African peoples in general from ancient times to modern times. So Du Bois's Star of Ethiopia would tell the story of ancient Africa from the distant past to the present day 
and their, their difficult circumstances in early 20th century and 19th century um, USA. And in one of Du Bois's pageants, The Star of Ethiopia, we see the Kandake featuring, which is remarkable. We see other ancient African heroines, the Queen of Sheba, uh, famous in Ethiopian culture. We see Ethiopia, who was a sort of queen promulgated by many ancient authors. And here we have the Kandake of Meroe being featured, this lady in sort of royal garb uh, being explored by Du Bois in his pageant, the Star of Ethiopia. The point of Du Bois putting all these characters in the Star of Ethiopia was to show how ancient African society was. Du Bois would not have been ignorant of the Greco-Roman geographies or the Christian texts or the Alexander romance describing the Kandake. And this is what he wanted to promulgate in this play, this pageant, a beautiful Nubian Sudanese queen in all this fantastic regalia and garb who would have showed how grandiose Africa was and also showed how deep its history was. A very different type of queen has also been connected with the Kandake. So this is something I need discovered very recently that Beyonce, the famous pop star, everyone I'm assuming is familiar with Beyonce, dressed in the garb of a Kandake. And this dress was uh, at the Wearable Art Gala in 2018. And this dress was designed by Falgani Shane Peacock. I apologize if I'm getting the pronunciation incorrect. And in Elle magazine, in the interview, they described why and a little bit of how this dress was designed. And they said that we wanted to create an art statement taking inspiration from the Nubian warrior queen, Amani Shaketo. This is the queen who we met earlier in these artistic reliefs, conquering many foreigners of the Meroitic Empire. We felt it was the perfect inspiration when designing for such a strong woman like Beyonce. Now, Beyonce, of course, as, as well as music, is known as a very strong symbol, strong symbol in African-American culture. So we can see these themes continue to flow into the modern times where Kandake is celebrated for her beauty, for her ability to lead her nation independently, and as a strong woman in a what's generally considered to be a patriarchal world. This continues into the video game industry. One of my favorite games growing up was Civilization. I never uh, played Civilization VI, one of the newer Civilization games in the franchise. And they have a Nubian faction in that game. In this game, you can play as many different factions all over the ancient world. And in the Nubian faction, the hero of this faction is the Kandake, again depicted as a strong ruling queen. Now, of course, these depictions, both Beyonce's and in civilization, from the point of view of a historian, they're not trying to be entirely accurate. And of course, we shouldn't look at it in this way. Accuracy is not why we're looking at the reception of ancient Kandake in the sense of dress or regalia or something. It's more the symbols and these themes that keep coming up again and again, this, this independent woman ruling this beauty and ruling ancient Nubia and these Nubian queens being a symbol for modern Sudanese, as well as Pan-African cultures. And you can see in this game of civilization, for example, they do really try and depict some things uh, as they are in the archeology span of Sudan. For example, most archeologists of Sudan will recognize this as Jebel Barkal, this famous and holy mountain uh, in the middle of Sudan that was a central place for Meroitic cultures. Uh, more recently, in 2020, so past the uh, after the time of Allah Salah's protest, we have this famous song Kandake, which is famous in Sudan, and this is actually the reason I began to do this sort of research, uh, because I like the song so much, and I recommend uh, that you should listen to it as well. And this song was uh, written and performed by Saito Simba and Mazmaz, two Afro-pop Sudanese singers, and roughly translated from online translation, uh, there's part of the lyrics read as such, a Sudanese woman, she's one of us, this Kandake, so this is sort of probably referring to Allah Salah, she has a beauty mark, she has a smile, her hair, it's like silk, those eyes wage wars, we saw that with the Greco-Roman authors, if one day, day she began to change. So all these lyrics are mentioning Allah Salah, but they also continue these themes that are established since the ancient commentators of the Kandake, this is a strong warrior woman ruling in Sudan who everyone can hope to be like. It doesn't end there. DC Comics and other comic book franchises also have a 
titled hero from Nubia or Sudan that almost certainly drew its inspiration on the Kandake, even if it's not mentioned. Although in concrete comics, they just call the name of this comic book hero Kandake, so it's almost certain that it has inspiration from the Nubian queen. But a perhaps more well-known is the counterpart to Super, uh, Superwoman and Diana from DC Comics, where we have Nubia. That's the name of the character, Nubia. She is a ruling queen of the Amazons in the DC comic franchise. I have not specifically read this, so I'm not certainly not an expert, expert on this comic book franchise. And she is modeled off these ancient Subi Nubian queens, obviously as the African counterpart to Diana. And in the early comics, they fight together, but then they join up. And it's got a complicated comic book history, but it keeps going on. And I'm sure there'll be more of this hero Nubia in the franchises. And we also see Kandake in modern times in Kingless. And this is a very ancient and complicated story. So I hope you bear with me for just a minute in this. Ethiopian Empire, which is south of Sudan in the modern country of Ethiopia, had a long tradition of making lists of kings going back to biblical times and going from biblical times to the times of medieval kings. So they'd record the names of hundreds of kings over time. In 1920s, in this book, In the Country of the Blue Nile, Charles Ray published a new king list, not a king list that was found in monasteries or something in Ethiopia, but a new king list published at the back of his book in 1927. And in this book, he tells us he was given this king list by Rastafari, the monarch of Ethiopia at the time. It says, may this reach my honorable friend, Mr. Ray, greetings to you. As you asked me to send you the names of Ethiopian kings and the history of the Ethiopian kings of kings, herewith I've taken a copy and send it to you. And then in the book, In the Country of the Blue Nile, Charles Ray publishes this new king list. When I say new, it's a king list that hasn't been reproduced before. There are many kings in this king list that can be found in other Ethiopian king lists and chronicles, but not all of the kings are found in the older Ethiopian chronicles. And amongst the leaders in this list are a few queens, which is really interesting. And amongst these queens, we see the name Kandake come up. So we have Nikala Kandake, Akalsis Kandake, and a few others, Nikolsis Kandake. So we have the, the word Kandake showing up in these lists when it refers to a ruling queen in ancient Ethiopia. Now, commentators and historians have talked about this list and what the sources for this list for were and whether these lists reflect some sort of um, new integration of foreign rulers. Some of these rulers in these lists uh, have Egyptian names and Nubian names like Tahaka and so forth. So it's not really certain what their connection is to Ethiopian monarchs, but trying to establish a long, long pedigree of Ethiopian monarchs. And part of that pedigree is including the name Kandake. So the Kandake remains of importance uh, beyond Nubia to various uh, regimes who are hoping to show their deep history and deep past. Uh, this gets into a larger conversation about how we revivify ancient heroes and heroines. Now, this is, happens throughout all cultures in modern times. When we go through political revolution or something like this, we often identify with and choose new heroes. So Europe during the 19th century and early 20th century, going through waves of nationalism uh, and independent nations like France, uh, Germany, and so forth, would find new heroes from the past to revivify, to make as icons of their country. So there's a famous example in Germany of the man of Hermann or Arminius who fought against the Roman Empire. England has similar thing in this form of Boudicca or in France you'd have Vercingetorix, these famous uh, freedom fighters, you might call them against the Roman Empire. Or even in Algeria, we have Jogurfa, which is promulgated in a bit of a later stage in the 1990s and a little bit before when Algeria was using figures of the past in its form of nationalism. You can also have different paths to revivification. So in Ethiopia, for example, which has long tradition of sanctifying saints from the ancient past, we have the King Caleb from the 500s uh, in the form of Saint Elisban still being worshiped as part of the Ethiopian church. 
Now, how does the Kandake fit into all this? Well, the Kandake fits both into uh, a rev revivification for Nubians. So it means very, something important for people from Sudan and Nubia and this area, but it also means something important as we've seen from Du Bois and others to pan to the deep history of Africa in general. This is a ruling beautiful queen who fought for her own nation uh, in ancient times. And so this hero I think has a long uh, history, but it's also will have a long history of the future in various media, various cultural politics, computer games, fashion, and everything in between, because it, of course the Kandake appeals to so many different ideals, not just Sudanese, but general things in ancient Africa, fashion, beauty, independent women, all these sort of things. So it has, so I think that this icon of the Kandake has quite a wide appeal and will continue to be popular into the future. Thank you so much for such an interesting talk. I certainly learned a lot. Uh, my special specialism is not uh, in, in Sudan, so I always like to uh, branch out a little bit. And uh, it was so interesting to trace this uh, sort of symbol of uh, the Kandake through time and ha how important it was both in uh, ancient times and even through to today. And thank you for bringing a new perspective to the EES events program. Uh, as I said, this was kicking off our Visualizing Egypt uh, theme for the next six months. So do check out our website uh, for our upcoming Spotlight lectures. So thank you again, Julian. Thank you for inviting me. And I just really enjoyed presenting to everyone. And thanks for the questions. Thank you very much. So thank you all. Uh, do check out our website for what's coming up and uh, do consider becoming an EES member if you can. Um, until next time, uh, have a wonderful start to 2023 and see you soon. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks.